Praise the Lord. Good evening, family. Good evening, friends. We are chap uh, Sermon 7, Part 2 of um, Christ the Healer by Pastor F.F. Bosworth. So the title of the chapter is How to Receive Healing from Christ. But um, Alex posted a very important question. Aren't we healed already? So siguro mas maganda, ano, uh, i-rephrase natin, but actually yun din yun, yung essence in other words, how do we begin to experience wholeness? Because wholeness is already ours because of the finished work as our only experience in this life. Correct? But before that, I would like to encourage you by a story. Last Friday, we had a town hall in the office. And uh, my dear office mate, um, a dear friend of mine, the head of training, um, who hosted the the program um, encourage everybody with this story. And mga bagets, this is very, very important. You know, Admiral McRaven? Never heard. Admiral McRaven is very famous. Um, he fought in the uh, in the war. I just, I'm not sure if World War II That's or right. one of the... Okay. Uh-oh. Admiral McRaven Uh-oh. Oh, sige na. World War II. Yeah. Graven. Yeah. William. William. McGraven. Anyway, he said this. Um, during the graduation of um, University of Texas to thousands of students, sabi niya, if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. That ain't a World War II general. That's literally a modern U.S. Yeah, animal. most probably. Uh, most probably uh, one of the Iran wars. Ganyan. If you want to change the world, start off, start off by making your bed. So furthermore, ang sabi niya, because if you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task and another and another. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made, and a, be- and a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better by William H. McRaven. While sitting down last Friday, I remember the Lord. Because who, the, who is the first one who actually resurrected from the dead and his first act is what? He made his bed, right? He made up his bed. He, diba when Peter, then came Simon Peter following him during the oh, resurrection, yeah. diba, Sunday, and went into the sepulchre and saw the linen cloths, the burial clothes, okay. as they lay, and the napkin that has been about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself, meaning it was folded neatly. So the resurrected Christ, his first act is to make up his bed. Right? So that's why every morning, that's why every now and then I'm telling you guys, oh, make up your bed. Ganyan. So but what am I... What am I, ano, um, I was so encouraged, you know, even even though in a very corporate setting, you see the Lord. Kasi, what does it mean? Because you and I rose from the dead with Him, correct? What does it mean? Remember when we studied um, in one of the episodes in um, the Gospel in 20 Questions? The, tomb, uh, the, the empty tomb wasn't empty, correct? Because there was the linen cloths. And the um why did ano uh, why did the john actually wrote this wrote this because it is very important in the cultural setting in the jewish cultural setting um uh, according to um this book in jewish insights into the new testament is the 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 bible is a, mi- a middle eastern culture so we must um read it uh, with that context ang sabe in biblical times there were customs governing how one should act when visiting a Jewish home. As Barbara Richmond explains in her book, Jewish Insights into the New Testament, the proper way to express gratitude after an evening of, of fine food and fellowship was crap, uh, casually crumple your napkin. Crumple your napkin. If, however, you had an unpleasant evening and, wa- and wish to express your displeasure, you would fold the napkin and leave it as you found it. So very neatly. A folded napkin was a slap in the face of the host. It was an unmistakable sign that he would never return to his house. So Jesus actually made a statement. 
he would never return back to the dead, right? He's never again to die because he's resurrected once and for all. He left the empty tomb. And you know what's the what is the implication of that? You and I rose up with him and we should never associate with ourselves with death anymore. We sh- nor with the nor with the uh nor with the origin of death it is what sin. Diba ano ba yung uh, um, cause of si- uh, result of sin? Sickness, poverty, lack and ultimately death, right? So we are not to associate with it just like what the Lord um uh uh did as an act, diba? He folded a napkin. Ganyan, he folded his burial clothes. So praise the Lord, the tomb uh, the tomb was an empty the tomb wasn't empty because the burial clothes were there. And we resurrected with him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So even though um during um uh, during throughout the day, you're talking to your boss, you're, you're having this corporate thingy, you know the Lord is with you. He's ever present with you. You just have to be aware of it. So back to the question, how do we begin to experience wholeness as our only experience in life? How do we begin? Or how do we constantly experience wholeness as our only experience in life? In Jeremiah 1 verses 10, in the New King's, New King James Version, it says, again, see, see, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Who is he saying, who is he talking to you and I? See today. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, you have the authority to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, and to build, and to plant. See this day I have. The church has seen full redemption, uh, most especially in physical body, as a day coming from the, the best is yet to come. Believing in a someday redemption once we die. So meron tayong uh, mindset or mentality na ganyan na, ah, pagdating mo sa langit. Eh, pagdating mo sa langit, wala talagang sakit doon. Then you will experience a complete resurrection and our bodies will be redeemed. But child of God, our, my sisters, my, my, my family, we need to hear the word of the Lord like Jeremiah did and have a this day or now understanding. John 5, 20, 25 says that the hour is coming and now is today. Today, we begin to constantly experience wholeness as our only experience in life. So what makes the hour that is coming the now is? Simply, how do we do? How do we walk in the wholeness experience? By simply walking in the understanding of all being finished. Again, how do we experience wholeness today? Simply walking in the understanding, having this mentality that all is past tense, finished. How do we know that we have full redemption in us? Because we know Christ dwells completely, fully in us, and He is redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30 in the NKJV. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So now you don't have any more a singular identity. You have a you have you are co-identified with the Lord. When he rose from the dead, you are now associated with him. You also rose with him. So you're not to associate with sickness, you're not to associate with disease. No more. Your identity is now infused with the Lord. When Jesus shouted, Tetelestai, it is finished from the cross. It was a cry of complete 100% victory. It was a declaration of finality. He was saying the old has ended, it's done, it is over. In Revelation 21, 5-6, John heard Jesus declare from the throne, Behold, see, in other words, I made all things new. Kainos, di ba? Naaral natin a um, uh, long time ago. Kainos is brand new. You are a new creation. Right. May imputate din nagsusulat. For these words are faithful and true. Ano daw yon? It is done. So all over your house, maganda, magandang, ano, magandang uh, maglagay, it is done, it is done, it is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. Dan, in Greek, is ginomai, which means to emerge, transitioning from one condition to one realm to another. It signifies a change of condition, state, or place. I make all new. It's, it is done. All has been made new. It is finished. We are co-seated with Him, completely whole, nothing missing, nothing broken in our lives here and now. So, importante, aralin natin yung hermeneutics. Alam nyo ba yung hermeneutics? Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. What is the difference between faith in Jesus or faith of Jesus? Meron man diferensya, mami? Meron. Meron man diferensya, tita? Meron. What is faith in Jesus or faith of Jesus? So, yung, yung Greek, yung koine Greek is the biblical Greek and used in the New Testament. <coughs> the word koine <coughs> means common. As the Greek language spread across the world <coughs> and interacted with other languages, it was altered. This alteration resulted in what we call today as koine Greek. <coughs> it is also known as the Alexandrian um, dialect, common Attic, Hellenistic, or Biblical Greek. It is the ordinary, everyday language of the people. And it is the language that was used in the Septuagint. And in Septuagint, it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It is the uh, uh, Septuagint to translate the Hebrew scriptures. So in Matthew 28, for example, ah, bago tayo pumunta dun sa faith in Jesus and faith of Jesus. Lesson in hermeneutics. Hermeneut hermeneutics. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything they have commanded you, and assuredly I am with you to the end of the very age. For example, when Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples, we read that with we read that we read this with a Western Western understanding, Western context, and interpret it from our church culture and language. We hear what we think is the Great Commission. Diba? In other words, we are to evangelize, go spread the gospel, and get people to repent of their sins and get saved. But if we understood the language and culture of the day, you would understand what Jesus meant by go. Diba? Go! And make disciples. Ano yung ibig sabihin ng go? The Greek word for go is poryunomai. Poryunomai. And it means to pursue one's journey and lead or others and, and lead or order one's life. Again, pursue one's journey. Parang yung lekleka in Hebrew. Diba? It is a participle meaning going, not go. Meaning in your going, as you're going, Make disciples, or in your everyday life and everywhere you go, make disciples. In whatever you do, when you are at work or at school, when you go hang out with a friend, when you go to a, when you go to church, or even when you go for a walk, make disciples. What does the kingdom of God look like? It's not about what we do or don't do, but it's Christ in us. It is righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit, all of which are finished and in us. So you just have to rest. Ganyan. Hallelujah and they will see. That's going and making disciples. Living in the finished, it is finished paradigm. It is bringing others to the awareness of the finished kingdom, kingdom life in them. In English, nouns are an essential part of sentences. But in Greek, it's all about the verbs. And these Greek verbs each have moods, tenses, and voices. Ano yung, ano, ano yung um, default tense in Greek? The aorist tense. Yan. It often gets misunderstood as past tense. But in, in the aorist tense, it means completed. It is a completed tense, done and finished. In other words, it doesn't need to be done again and in fact can't be done again. Nor can it ever be undone. While English is built primarily on the present, te present tense, the aorist tense is the default tense in Greek. In other words, finished. In other words, finished is your default tense because it is the default tense of the New Testament scripture. It is finished. 
tetelestai in Greek. In Luke 23 verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Forgive is an error stance. It is finished. The Father is not forgiving anyone today. Why? Because He has completely, fully forgiven all. All of mankind, ah, finished, done. In fact, when we mess up and ask Him to forgive us, we will always hear Him say, Forgiven! You are forgiven, not because He is right now forgiving us for what we have done, but because forgiven is who we are. Forgiven is who we are. Finished. Do we have to receive His forgiveness if it's already given? Of course. Of course. But it's received by understanding that He's already completely, fully forgiven us. There's a difference, ah. We receive by understanding that He's already completely, fully forgiven us. He can't forgive us any more than He already has. It is finished. It is done. Our receiving the truth means we've grasped it and now free in our thinking to experience His forgiveness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the Ioris is a completed action that took place at a point in time. When did God forgive? When did He forgive you? When? On the cross. It was fleshed out in time 2,000 years ago, but the cross is eternal, which means He completely forgave all mankind before even time ever began. All the way to Adam. Before Adam fell, he was completely, fully forgiven. It is finished. Before humanity ever sinned, they were forgiven. It is finished. We have always been eternally forgiven as you read <laughs> Ephesians 1. Another essential element of Greek grammar that we need to understand is the genetic, um, genetic possessive case of nouns. Because it denotes ownership. In our English Bibles, the word of is usually added in translation to help the verse read easier. <coughs> Although at times, a different preposition is used by translators such as the word in, <coughs> <coughs> which can cause us to interpret the verse as something we need to do. In Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God, so I, I, I will explain yung ano, ah, faith in Faith in, faith, faith in, at saka faith of Christ. So, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe, for there is no difference. The phrase is consist consistently rendered in the English translation as faith in Jesus Christ. The Greek, however, says pistis, lesu, christu, christu, which means the faith of Jesus Christ or Jesus Christ's faith. Both of the nouns, faith and Jesus Christ, are genetic possessive. Remember, genetic possession denotes ownership, meaning who owns the faith? Who owns the faith? Jesus. But translating it as in makes it sound like we need to put our faith in Jesus and we miss the importance of understanding that the faith belongs to Jesus. It is His. It is His. Romans 3.22 is an important verse to correctly understand how God's righteousness comes to us. It is by Jesus' faith or putting our faith in Jesus that we are made righteous. NLT says we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. ESV ganun din, CEV ganun din. There are only three translation uh, the only three translation and but most translations say something similar. The 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 versions that says faith of Christ, faith of Jesus Christ are KJV yung Duwe Rames at saka yung Darby and the Young's Literal. Why is an understanding of the words of or in critical? Because the faith of Jesus Christ says it's a free gift, a finished work. But faith in Jesus Christ makes it something we need to do to become, we need to do to become righteous or that God only accepts people because of their faith in Jesus. And that's just not true. <laughs> That makes it about our works instead of his finished work. Hallelujah. This is very important. It is the faith of Jesus Christ, not yours. So, even Charles Spurgeon, he spoke of, the, of, the, uh, he spoke of faith. My faith rests not in what I am or shall be or feel or know, but in what Christ is, in what he has done, in what he is now doing for me. Ang ganda, no? So, 
We rest in His faith and faithfulness. The Bible says there's only one faith, His faith. In Ephesians 4 verse 5, there's only one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and the Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. However, unfortunately, when we see the word faithful, we typically think of it as something we do. But being faithful is not, pa is not a pat on your back for staying true to Jesus or being loyal and unwavering in your Christian walk. No, it is being full of His faith. And we are full of His faith because His faith is in us. We, not, we may not be awakened to all of His faith, be, uh, faith believe, all that His faith believes yet, but nevertheless, His full faith is in us. Also, also, holy and faithful in these verses are not verbs. Paul isn't saying those who act holy and believe in Jesus. They are adjectives. They are your adjectives. You are holy and faithful because you are in Christ. Holy and faithful ones in Christ. So verse 21 and 22 of Romans 3 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ, toward all believing, for there is no difference. But now God's righteousness has been revealed completely, successfully, 100% through the faith of Christ. This righteousness was revealed toward all believing, for there is no difference. And the mere translation says, Jesus is what God believes about you. Jesus is what God believes about you. In Him, the righteousness of God is on display in such a way that everyone may be equally persuaded about what God believes about them. Regardless of who they are, there is no distinction. Every single person is equally persuaded, Jew and Greek. All mankind may be equally persuaded about what God believes about them. How? Because it is His faith, His because it's his faith in us that convinces us. It says, the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say our faith in Jesus. Although that's what a lot of translations will say. The word faith and Jesus Christ are genitive possessive. It's his faith. And the next verse is probably one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. And while I do think that believing is important, we made it more, way more complicated than it was meant to be. We've made it something we do to receive rather than just a response to what is true. Receiving, okay, receiving wholeness is simply comprehending, grasping, and identifying with what God says it is, is already true about us. Again, receiving wholeness is simply comprehending, grasping, identifying with what God says is already true about us. And believing is to be fully persuaded in and by his faith and identifying in what he says is, uh, says is true about us and what is already ours. What is this? As he is, so are we in this world. He is faithful, so we are faithful. We rest in his faithfulness. And that actually is so restful. Hallelujah. Because the bottom line is the finished work has never been about our faithfulness. It was always about His. Romans 3.3 3 says, What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? In verse 4, Paul says, Certainly not. In 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul says, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. It's His faith and His faithfulness that we rest in, in every area of our life, including our health, our wholeness, our healing. Jesus said in John 4, 23, The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. You know another word for praise? Is to tell the story. To tell your story. What is the story? It is finished. The word seek in Greek is zeteo. This is where the strong concordance doesn't help. When you look at the uh, Hebrew, the equivalent Hebrew of sick, zeteo, is masa, meaning to find, to discover, and the root means to come forth. The first time masa is used, and in the Greek Septuagint, it is the word zeteo, is in Genesis 19.11. And they smote 
the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, ito yung Sodom and Gomorrah, di ba? Both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. They were blind and couldn't see the door. These men were demanding the door. They were they were simply searching for something they weren't able to see. Same with the Father. He is not an egotistical God demanding and requiring our worship. He was searching for something that he wasn't seeing, the, seeing in the earth through worshipers. In Hebrews 10 verse 2, For worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have felt guilty of their sins. The word worshiper, you and I, is latreuyo. The word is also used in Luke 4 verse 8. It says, You shall worship, proskuneo, the Lord your God, and him you shall you shall serve, latre, latreuyo. The mere Bible says with undivided attention rather than shall you serve. Undivided attention to what? To his word, it is finished. The word latureo is a word very intense. Love, intense love. Lovers worship or adore one another. So you know that um, uh, as you worship the Lord, actually he's also worshiping you. He adores you. This morning, I'm very happy when the uh, worship leader in your creations church he said, no, you know that Abba Daddy God adores you? Abba Daddy God worships you? It's correct, actually. So, because lovers worship or adore one another, it is mutual or a co-participation of worship, adoration, praise, and celebration of each other. Make no mistake, you are not the only one praising and worshiping. He is praising and worshiping you as well. One of the Hebrew words, how is this, Tita? One of the Hebrew words for worship is bara. It is found in Genesis 1.28 in the first mention of worship. Our English Bibles translate it as blessed, but the word barak means to kneel in adoration. Mali yung painting ni, ano, ni Michelangelo. It should have been this. Yan. God kneeled down in adoration over you, His beautiful creation, adoring you, worshiping you, Barak, kneeling down. It's like when Jesus came to earth, right, during Christmas time 2,000 years ago, correct? Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. So, now, believers, sisters and brothers in Christ, the newness of life has now come because of it is finished. Living, living life in His faith. That's why you can say, and boldly declare, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I, now, which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of, of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We live in his faith. It's where we're positioned. It's a fixed place, a firmly rooted, established place. We don't have to do anything to live in that place. We're there, we're there now because we, we were co-crucified and made co-alive in Him by His faith. This is our newness of life. Such a big, overwhelming thought, but at the same time, such freedom. It's all about His faith, not ours, not even corporately. It doesn't depend on us. It's not about us. It's all about Him. So, Tetelestai in John 19 verse 30. When Jesus has received the sour wine, he said, It is finished! And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Tetelestai comes from the verb teleo, which means to bring to an end, to complete or to accomplish. It is the word you would use when you climb the uh, peak of Mount Everest. It's the word you would use when you turn in the final copy of your dissertation. It's the word you would use when you make the final payment on your house or car. The word means more than just I survive. It means I did exactly what I set out to do. So I was reminded by Facebook, actually, I posted this um, eight years ago. It is finished. Therefore, rest. Why? You know, um, lastly, you know that he, Jesus found rest in loving you. He found rest in loving you. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head in Matthew 8.20. In the original Greek text, the word lay is a very unique Greek word, klino. It is seldom used in the New Testament. The only other place it is used in terms of Jesus resting his head is at the cross. 
when Jesus hung on the cross and cried, It is finished! The Bible says that he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The word bowed here is the same Greek word, klino. It, is, it was only at the cross that the Son of Man finally found a place to rest his head. Jesus found his rest in redeeming you. Jesus found his rest in saving you. He found his rest in loving you. And that, my dear family, is chapter 7, part 2. Praise the Lord. Thank you.